I'd like to play a Starcry game that Starcry. Ha- Starcry. I'd like to play. <laughs> pretend I didn't. Say I that. love Starcry. Uh, <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, in their first listener suggested discussion, Jim, Doc, and Chris speculate on the death of couch co-op games and how they can be revived. Plus, impressions of Far Cry Primal, the vanishing of Ethan Carter, and Fire Emblem Fates. The Backward Compatible podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 59 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Doc. Hey, everybody. And I'm joined by Jim. Good afternoon. And uh, we've alluded to it before, but today's the first day we're going to be doing a uh, meaty discussion that it comes from one of our listeners. This comes from screen name uh, Ragda, uh, R-A-G-D-E, sorry for mispronouncing that. He would like to hear our thoughts on the death of local co-op and how it can be revived again. And so we've uh, taken that question, and we've done a little bit of research and a little bit of thought on it, and we're going to talk about that in our media discussion for today. Nope. Oh, wait. We had homework? Kind of, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, listeners? My, my, my <laughs> yeah, we have listeners. Homework, that's, so. that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the big news. <laughs> that's the big news. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, of course, uh, this is open to anyone who is a listener of ours who wants to hear us talk about stuff. And uh, thank you, uh, Ragda, for being the first to ask us something. Um, without further ado, we'll open with our normal starting segments, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I gotta say, I gotta start off here because I just finished playing Far Cry Primal. I believe I talked a little bit about it last time, I think. This is on my list. This is one of my games I'm excited about. Uh, temper. Temper that excitement. Uh, really? <laughs> well, unless... Let me put it this way. If you really like... If you really like the the style of the Far Cry games, um, and you're thinking, "Gee, let's," I would like a, I'd like to play a Star Cry game that Star Cry, ha- Star Cry. I'd like to play. A, <laughs> pretend I didn't. Say I it. love Star Cry. Uh, um, that actually sounds like a fun series. It does yeah. sound like a great yeah. series. Um, or like an '80s TV show. Tune in next week whenever we develop the game. Oh, we Star, develop Cry. Star Cry. Like, okay, let's do it. Let's take a minute of that. Uh, no, but uh, if you really like the Far Cry story, like you're like, I, I just love. The depth of story in Far Cry. There's a depth but, of story in Far Cry. Oh, I, 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 I'm kidding. And let's get to get worse. So, the, so if you if you're like I I, I kind of like the Far Cry games, but there's a little too much story, like it's too deep. Uh, Primal will will scratch that edge because it's got even less. <laughs> I should say even less developed. Well, they're story. cavemen, so they grunt a lot. Like you know. Right? No, that's not no. the bad part. So let me. Okay, so let me let me preface this. When I first started playing Far Cry, I Far Cry Primal. I was enjoying it. I thought it was interesting. Mm-hmm. One of my first early thoughts, I may have mentioned this last time on the podcast, was when you when you first start the game, you don't see yourself at all. And you don't, like, develop your character. You don't design your character. There's no mirrors because you're in a primitive setting. Sure, yeah. So my thought is, oh, it kind of makes you feel... You're, you're, you sort of feel more like you're in this time because back then people really didn't know what they looked like. Insert agency discussion here. Yeah, I got it. Right. Uh, unless you saw your reflection. But it's a little more than that. It's, unless you see your reflection, like... A, a river, in which case the water's moving, mm-hmm. you're not really going to know what you look like. Or a like still back- pond, or a reflecting pond. Right, but there's not tons of those around, mm-hmm. and you're not going to be able to stand there for too long because of all the predators and shit. Oh, I got you. The point is, people didn't have the sort of the sort of understanding that we do about what we look like mm-hmm. back then. And then I thought this was on purpose by the designers. You mm-hmm. could never see what you look like because you go to the waters, you could never see. It's not still enough. So I thought that was an interesting choice. And then I opened up the menu later when I had gotten a skill, and I see a picture of my character. Ah. So oh. I just just that sort of like encapsulates my thoughts on Far Cry Primal is that the whole thing was like that. It was just. You think they're doing something on purpose, and then you realize, no, it doesn't really work, and then you get disappointed because they completely crap all over it later. And that was kind of my feeling on it. Like, the the story, for example, um, you think, oh, they're trying to get you into the story because no one speaks English. They all speak in this made-up tribal language. They're really trying to draw you into the story. Isn't this cool? And uh, you can read the subtitles, of course, but it makes you feel like, oh, it's more like you're actually here in this time. And then you start to, to, to meet more of the characters. And they're extremely silly and unrealistic. Hmm. Like, 
One of them um, is like this tribal shaman guy, and he just goes way over the top. He just wants to piss on everything. Then another one, some, someone really likes piss, by the way, in this company. Then another character who has like who lost an arm, um, he also uh, pisses on your character and calls you piss man for the rest of the game. <laughs> Then you've got. I wish Wait, I was. You're not kidding. speaking metaphorically. No, this is I'm literal. not. I'm literal. <laughs> there's actual. There's two characters that are obsessed with pissing on you. Okay. And then there's also another character that is um, supposedly this. He's the inventor that will come up with all these things that advance humanity, and uh, that they tell you about. You go. You go seek him out, and um, he. Okay. Everybody else in the game is like darker skin, like kind of range from different skin tones, but uh-huh. they're essentially look like they're. Uh, like maybe the game takes place somewhere near Africa, or like mm-hmm. a lot of the human beings might be like out of Africa people kind mm-hmm. of things so yeah. who have darker skin. Makes sense. Oh, but this guy, the inventor, um, Uric, uh, he's just straight up a redneck from like Tennessee. He has a literal he's literally speaks the language, the primitive language, with a um southern accent. <laughs> I am not kidding. You have these different quests these quest threads, aside from just getting other people, you also have the okay, I have to defeat these two other tribes that are trying to destroy your people, which are the uh what is that, the Wedja, I think? The Winja? Yeah, Winja. So there's there are there is sort of a quest resolution whenever you um, finally beat both of those tribe mm-hmm. leaders. But you can approach them in totally different order. You can do things out of order, that kind of thing. I think there's a little bit too much freedom in this game because it hmm. it doesn't feel focused at all. And when you win, when you beat those two, there's no like there's no real ending per se. Like you can technically do enough quests to where you do all the village quests, you do all the quests for your people, you have all the people, and you do those two final quests. You can technically get the credits to roll, but it never really feels like you beat the game. Hmm. There's just a complete lack of tension. It's the whole game is there's there's you're, you're traveling from one place to the other, gathering resources mostly, which is kind of boring, but you have to do it to increase your stuff. You can hunter scavenger uh, makes sense. Yeah. yeah, you can take out bases like you normally can in Far Cry. Mm-hmm. Um, you you do have some things where you can tame animals, but a lot of that stuff it's so repetitive after a while. Like the first maybe six hours or so, I was enjoying it, but it gets very repetitive. Yeah. And there's no there's no guidance in terms of the of of, of enough of a of enough of a drive of the tension to make you really care about the game. I looked at my playtime at the end. I'd actually play like twenty two hours, and I don't know how I put up with it because I kept thinking the game's going to get better. The game's got to get better. And most of the game that I honestly played the game mostly on autopilot. At, at a certain point, because I was I was basically just grinding. I'm going to try to beat it. I, I I went through and I beat the two final missions, which were not as hard as they really should have been and were not as satisfying. And at the end, I, I honestly, I look back on it, and I would say overall, I was disappointed in the game. It really should have been maybe a $20 game, um, $20 to $30 game, half price. Yeah. Because there wasn't... There wasn't as, and then I think they just tried to flesh it out with more content to sell it at 60 and uh, it didn't work. That's it just shame. felt really, really unfocused. And this is from someone I absolutely adored, uh, Blood Dragon. I, I loved it. Um, it was a much shorter game, and I think it that helped it. You would absolutely hate Mad Max then. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Mad Max has about six or seven different types of activities that you do. Hmm. And then it, it's very, very samey from that point on. Hmm. I mean, hmm. it's it's about Max having his car stolen and then going and getting his car back. And there's a couple of bosses he fights on the way. Um, the end uh, is kind of cinematic. It's, it's it's kind of fun. I could really see this um, being a, a good Mad Max movie where all the samey stuff happens once. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as the, the world design and all that stuff, it's brilliant. It's fantastic. I loved it. I actually put something on TV on my iPad and then um, played the game uh, in autopilot, as you're saying, yeah. and enjoyed it very much. But uh, after... After I beat it, um, and by the way, it's an extremely dark game. Mm. Don't expect a happy ending. I mean, it's very, very dark. You don't get your car back? Um, you do get your car back. <laughs> well, that's, that's all <laughs> the happy ending you need. Well, <laughs> uh, but pretty much every, every let's call it friend, um, to, to get a little, a little spoilery, um, the game actually makes a really big point out of, no, Max, you need friends. You need love. You need to, to stop detaching yourself from everything around you. And, and re-engage with, with the human species again. And he does this, and it all falls apart. Yeah, mm. because he's an 80s action hero. You don't need love or friends or people. <laughs> right, You exactly. just need yourself. <laughs> I mean, quite, quite literally, everyone that he loves <laughs> just dies a horrible death Yeah, um, by the end of it. And so... Um, the first Mad Max really is actually very dark. It is very dark. Very and, dark. And so in that sense, it's a great game, but it's very, very samey. And, and it reminded me, honestly, it reminded me of... Uh, 
Assassin's Creed, the very first one, before mm. they kind of had honed in on what was good and what wasn't and what was samey and what wasn't. And you could tell they put a lot of love into the game, uh, but they they created a lot of content, really, really good content that was uh, coming at the, a, a new place the same way. Or the same kind of place in a new way. You know what I mean? It, mm. but, but it was very... Um, if you liked repetitive content and you don't mind repetitive content, it's it's the game for you. Speaking of repetitive content, I had a chance to finally play The Witness, uh, which is great. Uh, I love the way the puzzles teach you, and um, if you don't know what you're doing, go down the path a little bit. You'll find it more. It's open world. Um, and what I really liked about The Witness was that you could you could do it in your own way and all that, but there's like zero story at all. Um, now, there are two types of puzzles, I would say. There's the obvious ones, and then there's the sort of hidden ones. There's supposed to be a secret ending, but quite frankly, I, I think they hid it a little too much. Because when I realized that there were extra kinds of puzzles there, and I realized that the only way that I was going to find them all is if I basically started over from scratch at the very beginning, I abandoned the game. I was happy with the ending that I had, and I walked away from it. So what I picked up instead was Firewatch. It's another game we've recently talked about. And what I liked about Firewatch was um, the interaction and the dialogue felt meaningful until you get to the end and you realize it's not. And it, it kind of left a weird taste in my mouth and I couldn't figure out why. So I'll come back to that in a minute because I have figured out why. Because the next game that I picked up was The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. Now, it's, it's been my finals. Can you, can you tell? Um, I'm on an eight-week term, and so I've played lots of video games <laughs> because I've been doing finals and I needed a break. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but Vanishing of Ethan Carter, this is about two years old. And the opening scroll, whenever you hit New Game, says, This game is a narrative experience that doesn't hold your hand. End quote. I'll say it again. This game is a narrative experience that doesn't hold your hand. That kind of cast all the games I've been playing lately into a light and made me ask, Mad Max, was it holding my hand? Firewatch, was it holding my hand? Witness, was it holding my hand? What does that mean? What does that metaphor mean, holding your hand? And I and I think with Vanishing of Ethan Carter, because it's very light on dialogue mm. um, in terms of interaction with your character, but from, from the very beginning, you kind of walk out of a tunnel and it's very apparent that you're kind of a ghost like ethereal creature person who's been called into this world to solve some kind of supernatural mystery. Mm. Just, I mean, you don't encounter any living people. You encounter shadows or memories. Um, and you have to piece back together the um, the crime scene. We'll call it a crime scene. And uh, then when you do that, you can replay the scene and you have to pick the order and, and the sequence of the, the scene. And then when you do it right, it plays out in front of you and you figure out Ethan is the boy. Uh, you figure out what's happened to Ethan and, and it kind of leads you to the next place. So in that sense, it kind of does hold your hand. The The story is still kind of linear. Now you can go off, kind of wander off and do stuff in your own order, but there's a right way to do it. So I don't think that the claim is exactly true. Um... I think the witness honestly does narrative that doesn't hold your hand even better because it's completely off the rails and there's no narrative embedded in it. There's a backstory, but we're not sure what that is. So it's not heavy handed. Mad Max, on the other hand, completely holds your hand and tells you exactly what to do next, but it's a big open world that's got lots of samey stuff and you can do that in any order. But the narrative is extremely linear. So, But do you think the hold your hand comment is necessarily referring to linearity? Versus open, well, or do you I think assumed. it's refer- or do you think instead it's referring to you having to seek out your answers, or you having to find things for yourself, as opposed to the game saying, "Go here, yeah, now I, go here, I, I now go here." It sounds to me like that's what because they that's mean. what I think they meant by. And that. if that's yeah. the that's case, what I think you meant by that. Right? That that casts some light on Firewatch too, because that's that was one of my problems with Far Cry Primal. Yeah. It's very much okay. Uh, go here, go here, go here. Okay, go this. here, yeah, go yeah. here. Do this in an open world game, right? Well, and and then and that brings me to back to Firewatch, which is the the real point and the, probably the most impactful of all the games that I've played mm. was Firewatch. I enjoyed the story of Firewatch more than any other story, even though the choices I made were meaningless within the context of what happened actually happened next. But my reaction to it within the context of the game built a story in my head that by the end of the game made the story meaningful. So there's there's a difference here between the 
uh, let's let's say like the the tales of Borderlands, which is what I'm play, playing now. I'll mention that one next next time. Tune in next time for my reaction to Tales of Borderlands, um, where and we've talked about this. We've talked about the tales of you know uh, s- series before, um, but but with Firewatch, what's going to happen happens. There's really no variance at all in what happens. But the things you say or choose to say to the person on the other end of the radio who you never meet builds a narrative in your head that to you as the player feels like the game is not holding your hand. Hmm. So I think Firewatch succeeds at a narrative experience that doesn't hold your hand but, better than Ethan Carter. But when you say doesn't hold your hand, you're specifically referring to the narrative not telling you, not giving you answers about the story, letting you piece together the story yourself. Well, it's not just about the story. It's, there's a I'm mystery. Just, I'm in, asking. I'm there's asking. There's a mystery in Firewatch, and I, I won't spoil that one because it's right. fun. Um, but the mystery is going is going to be solved. If you play the game, you're going to solve the mystery. You have to solve the mystery. Mm-hmm. The answer to the mystery is always the same. Um, but what you say about it in context changes. Not doesn't change what is true. It just changes how you are as a character slash player. But in another sense, not I haven't heard. I have not played this game, but I've heard some about it. Uh-huh. So, like for example, can you die in this game? Can you? No. That's, yeah, right. So in a sense, it holds your hand. In the sense yeah. of. You will continue along on this path and eventually reach your you goal. You feel like someone, to use a metaphor, you feel like someone in a river, the river's carrying you along. Mm-hmm. What you cr- uh, choose to say as you're in the river is completely up to you within the context of the four or yeah, five choices like, you have. But you have, you have some freedom to interpret the narrative as you will. You feel like you're... You feel like you were influencing your perception of the story. Maybe, no, actually, I think that's giving it too much credit. I think that the only thing you're you're allowed is a reaction, and that reaction has no impact. But because so you said way, it a the certain way, the way you describe it, I would not. I would hesitate to refer to it as a video game. Personally, I know. I know. Not I, not saying that's and a I don't bad think thing. It is. I'm not saying that's a in bad fact, thing. In fact, I think Alex said the same thing in, in the last episode. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. th- that it was yeah. more like an, an interactive. Um, and I think Isaac said that it was more like an interactive mm-hmm. um, novel or novella. Yeah. And, but, and I think that's. And I think it's important to preface that by saying that when we say something is not a game, we we are not saying it is an insult. To that's preface right. that, no. we are. It's just a distinction to say what sort of experience you're getting. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, well, and, and if we want to make the accusation... Because I, like, I, like inter- I like interactive stories. I, I've played well, several of them. Me too. But I think it's the equal and opposite portions of what the witness is. Mm-hmm. Because the witness... I, I sat staring at a screen for 15, 20 minutes without moving, mm-hmm. without touching my controller. Um, I, was, I was solving stuff by writing on my television with a whiteboard marker, taking pictures <laughs> of it with my phone, literally. And, yeah, I think then, I saw some of those that you, yeah, you I put, it on, put Facebook. on Facebook. Yeah, and, and so I'm like... This is a this is a completely different gaming experience. It's not a video game. I'm not I'm not mashing buttons to do a thing. You know, nothing's progressing, um, but it is. And so I, I love that we're now experimenting with these types of things in the eighth generation mm-hmm. because I think it's what's been missing in this generation. Now that we have you know the opportunity to do some beautiful beautiful worlds, and I got to tell you, Ethan Carter, stunning stunning graphics, beautiful beautiful stuff. Um, all those games do a thing very, very differently. And the thing that they do is draw the player through the experience. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You've been busy. I've been, I've been busy. Uh, I also wrote two papers. So. <laughs> so, Chris, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, your gameplay experiences this week? So, yeah, I've been playing Fire Emblem Fates recently. Um, and I went ahead and got uh, Birthright first. Um, I was sort of reading up a little bit on it, and a good friend of mine... Um, who's also a big Fire Emblem fan, decided to get Conquest. So it was almost one of those things where, like, you know, if your friend got Pokemon Red, you get Pokemon Blue. Um, Is it Will? Uh, no, not oh. Will. Although I, I'm not sure which one Will got first. Um, but what I was I was reading up a little bit, too, and I was deciding um, which one I would want to get, hypothetically. And in addition to some of the story stuff, I think I kind of like the idea behind Birthright a bit better. Um, but what I was reading also suggested that Birthright is the more classic Fire Emblem experience about the difficulty you'd expect on a normal Fire Emblem game. And then Conquest is almost like hard mode. So Conquest is designed specifically in a lot of ways to be a much harder experience, much more challenging experience. Um, and for reasons that I won't get into right this moment. Um, but I went ahead and also I downloaded the DLC, which for those of you who are concerned that you have to buy both games in order to get both experiences, mm-hmm. um, you actually can get the second game for half off. What you do is you buy the game that you want first, 
and then you go into the DLC shop and you can download the other path, the other side of the story, basically, oh, cool. for 20 bucks instead of 40 So basically what you've done is you spent $60 and you get both games. Um, and if you do that before you start the game, you actually do have the option when you come to the, sort of the decision moment in Chapter 6 of which side are you going uh, are you going to side with? Mm-hmm. Um, are you going to choose the family that raised you? Are you going to choose the family that you're born to and got kidnapped from? Um, if you just bought the one game, if you bought Birthright, you choose the family that you're born to. If you bought Conquest, you choose the family that raised you. Um, but if you buy the DLC first, you actually do have a choice. Dance with the one that brung you, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, I'll, I'll, I will give them credit. They did a pretty good job of having you play through enough missions on both sides. Um, kind of through this weird circumstance of you get like um, strung along in this mission by one side and then get captured by this other side. But, you know, kind of get to know them a little bit. Um, to the point where um, you are potentially a little bit torn between the two sides. And so in that sense, I think that it has a stronger story to begin with than, say, Awakening did. Uh. The slight disappointment that I'm having with the story right now, while the gameplay is really awesome, um, is that, especially in the support conversations, yeah, and it could be that a big part of it's um, because they have more characters, they have to cover a full mm-hmm. roster of characters for both sides. Or it could also be the rewritten dialogue in the English version. You see, I don't know I don't know if that's it, because just in general, like, cause not even knowing like which parts of the dialogue have been changed, if any, um, <laughs> because you've done a lot more research. Don't say if any. We know that it <laughs> we, is. We know that there are some, but hi, hi, speaking hypothetically. Okay. Not knowing in fantasy world. what has been... <laughs> What has been changed? Um, I feel like a lot of the conversations lack a certain depth that the the Awakening had. Yeah, um, exactly. They, they, That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. The, but the, a lot of the characters feel very <laughs> um, vague, and the relationships between them seem kind of contrived. And almost like they're um, spouting memes instead of actually having real conversations. Some of them more so than others. <laughs> and some of them are pretty good. Like I'm not going to say that all of them are terrible. Just like as a general observation. Are, it's are you a weaker. pickle pal, Chris? I am not a pickle pal. I've okay. not seen that conversation. Oh, okay. But I saw you post bit on Twitter. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> I have no idea what you guys are talking about, but I am enjoying you railing on Fire Emblem. One of the other things I noticed, too, is the, the marriage system, which was really interesting and awakening. Um, it's also very central to Awakening's mm-hmm. design. Yeah, marriage I would system. say so. And this one has it, and they kind of like use this sort of like you send your child off to be safe in this other world that has time to move faster, so when they come to yours, they've grown up. Um which is an interesting kind of workaround because the last time I had to do with time travel as well. Hmm. Um, but in the last one, it really felt like when you're sort of getting to know these characters and you're building up support, the bond does seem like it could be moving toward romance pretty clearly. Mm-hmm. And what I've observed so far is that a lot of them, the C to A support conversations are kind of one thing, and then marriage is like a totally different thing. Like almost like there's this leap that doesn't seem like it should be there. So it seems like there's. The the support conversations has always been a big draw of Emblem for me, especially since Awakening, because they emphasized it so much, is a little bit weaker in this one so far. Uh, maybe when I get over to Conquest or once I've played more and I've seen more of them, I'll have a different opinion, but uh, so far that's been my impression. But of course, gameplay-wise, um, it's Fire Emblem's always. Um, they've made a few tweaks and improvements that I think are really well done, so I'm not, I won't talk about that too much now because I want to finish playing the game. Um, but overall, gameplay really good, story perhaps something to be lacking. This is Backtalk, where someone shares their thoughts on a previous discussion they missed. I wasn't here last week, um, as uh, some people may be aware, so uh, y'all met with both Alex and Isaac to Mm -hmm. talk about procedural generation and gaming. Yep. Um, I'm a little disappointed that I didn't get to talk about that, because I do have some interest there. Um, But I did want to mention, I actually, all my thoughts are positive, by the way. Jim being positive? (laughs) What? (laughs) um, uh, Y'all did talk about some games that I'm not too interested in, but a lot of the thoughts that you had, generally speaking, were things that I, you know, echoed a lot of my experiences and Mm -hmm. found it very interesting. Um, When Alex was talking some about uh, sports sims in particular, I thought I had shared some of my experiences with that, for example, with Football Manager. Um, One of the games that I would have liked to talk about, I'll mention it a little bit briefly here, is a game called Extreme Warfare. Hmm. Um, this is actually a uh, proce- uh, procedural sim that uh, generates professional wrestling. Oh, interesting! And uh, the interesting—it's—it's—it's it's, it's very interesting. Now, the game doesn't have any graphics; it is pure text. Really, hundred <laughs> percent simulation. And the idea is that you are managing your own uh, professional wrestling federation, hmm. and uh, you have—and of course, people have made mods where you can just insert real characters mm-hmm. from various like the, it's actually has a very strong mod community where they'll take for example like one like a period of like two years mm-hmm. and they'll literally mod every wrestler that was in the the uh, united states mm-hmm. during that 10-year period and i mean a couple year period and 
it's actually very extensive. People do a lot of research on this. Mm-hmm. So the way the game works is uh, you basically control everything about those characters. You control um, who, who they're feuding with, what's their gimmick, um, who wins and who loses, obviously, but not just that, how they win and lose, mm-hmm. uh, what sort of matches they're in. And the whole point is, it's not obviously it's not about like winning or losing because you know it's it's a fake sport. Right. But what it's really about is you have to generate revenue. Mm-hmm. You have to generate sales. You mm-hmm. have to drive tickets. How much do, are people getting into the characters? Mm-hmm. How much do they like that feud? And how much did they enjoy mm-hmm. watching the show? Yeah. Making me want to play the RPG. Yeah. We, yeah. we talked a little bit the about this. Uh, it didn't come up in the actual episode, but if you guys check out the bonus compatible mm-hmm. from the last episode, um, we touched briefly on the uh, worldwide wrestling uh, RPG, which has a lot of elements like this. Yeah. So, but this, I mean, this one is like, uh, and I assume that one actually is, has graphics to it. Uh, it's a tabletop. Oh, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. We should yeah. play that at some point. Yeah, we definitely should. Um, but yeah, this one, this one is like completely abstract in the sense that it's all text, it's all reading, it's all, it's, it's, it's very interesting that, that they decided to go this way. And I played it for um, actually quite a while. I haven't played it, or thought of it recently until y'all, Alex brought that up. But it's a very interesting uh, simulation that I, I definitely recommend if you're if you're into simulations, even if you don't have an interest in, in professional wrestling, which mm-hmm. honestly I haven't had for like over ten years mm-hmm. at this point. Actually, more than that now. Come to think of it, <laughs> but it it sort of it brings a lot of those memories back, and it does a really good job of putting you into the shoes of a promoter, which I find very interesting. Yeah, sounds cool. Yeah, I'd actually like to give that a try. Would you Would you classify it as IF interactive fiction? Um, I might. Uh, I would say it's it's definitely more focused on. Well, yes, and I'll and I'll say why because the simulation elements are not just about going through like literally every move. There is additional elements of the characters' backstories. Like for example, characters will have um, obviously they have social lives and they'll have traits. And for example, um, I actually imported a bunch of old WWF uh, wrestlers from like. 91 or something like that so i had jake the snake jake the snake roberts if yeah. y'all remember wrestling he was a he was a very well-known wrestler extremely popular and but one of the, his biggest problems was he was very heavy into drug use which is why he never really got pushed as like the top guy because they couldn't trust him they mm-hmm. thought he was gonna so he, he's an alcoholic and he was heavy into drugs and so what happens is if you, if you decide that you're gonna trust this guy because there's all these behind the scenes stats you can that people build into the characters that are part of the game and if you trust this guy, there is a chance that he might no show events because he's too drunk, huh. or he's too, or he, or he might drug out. Or by the way, he could actually just overdose. He could just OD and die. And other characters can, oh. yeah, and, and not just him. I mean, it's any character. I just I bring him up specifically mm-hmm. because he actually it, he actually died during one of my runs. He actually no showed an event, and then later there was a news article about him being found dead in his apartment. And I freaked mm-hmm. out because he was my champion at the time. Uh, this, by the way, reflected extremely poorly on my company because the world title was on a guy who died mm. so uh but the but that is an interesting uh narrative element and it brings additional um problems that you have to address right but it makes it very interesting because mm-hmm. anything can happen you do get that experience mm-hmm. and if this game did have graphics it would be pretty much i mean almost impossible to 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 show all of these possibilities mm-hmm. yeah so the game in the series that i played um that version is called total extreme wrestling 2015 <laughs> they have a 2016 version out now. Total extreme. Um, and it's actually programmed by one person, a British programmer named Adam Ryland. All okay. done by one man. Mm. Yes. One British man. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, one, that's like a real man. <laughs> one, one chap. <laughs> one chap. Yeah. Well, one, one bloke. All <laughs> done by one chap. <laughs> we, we, like, we like British people. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Well, I've been on the hunt for a game called Quantum recently, and my goal behind Quantum was to find a game where the dice represented ships, Hmm. um, spaceships, Um, because I had heard about it, and and there's an interesting story behind the game, and and, and we actually talked about that in in another uh, podcast. Hmm. Bonus compatible. Yeah, last time, and and, and it's in the bonus uh, material, but um, so I've been on the hunt for it, but I couldn't find it because it's actually really popular and and the stores are not keeping it in um, so I guess I'm gonna have to get it on Amazon eventually but I like to support the local store so I, I'm talking with one of the one of the guys at the store there um, a buddy of mine named Logan and he says listen if, if you like that mechanic and you're interested in that mechanic you need to try rattle battle grab the loot and I'm immediately thinking no 
I assuming that's rattle battle colon grab the loot and that pause wasn't you saying or him saying to you grab the loot. No, the no it, it, that's part of the title. <laughs> so, so you're just shuffling winking. Grab the loot. <laughs> so I'm standing here holding this thing and it's and it's a Polish uh, designer and, and it's a board game um, with with no board. So it's really a, a dice um, a dice management game, if you will. Hmm. And and you roll the dice and the, they are the ships and you actually roll in the box. And the box is the ocean. And I'm looking at this thing going, I just don't know. Um, weird cartoons, you upgrade your ship, you do other things. But I gave it a shot. Mm-hmm. And I gotta say, it is incredibly fun. And it is so completely like un- unlike mm-hmm. anything else that I have played recently in the board game realm. Uh, the closest thing, and it's a terrible, terrible comparison, but the closest thing would be Roll for the Galaxy because mm-hmm. you've got. Um, Dice that you put in your cup, and I talked about that uh, in another episode recently. Uh, but but in this case, the the dice that you have are your ships, and you give the ships to the Baron, and the Baron rolls the NPC ships, rolls your ships, and, and they're rolled all at once, and then that's the state of the ocean uh, whenever you start. And if you have sails, you can spend sails to move the dice. If you have cannons, and you roll the cannon on the dice because they're all they're all unique. Mm. Um, then you can actually fire, um, and, and you do these other things. And your goal is to sink the NPC ships with lower value than what you rolled, um, or rather what was rolled, because there's not a lot of rolling. It's just one one roll, mm-hmm. right? Hmm. Um, and, and, and to sink those ships and, and board those ships and loot those ships. And so the, the title, Rattle Battle, I think it's just a poor translation problem, mm. uh, and and it's the rattling is the dice. Oh, right? We rattle the dice, yeah. right? Oh, and okay. then the battle mm. part that's obvious, mm. but it rhymes, and so it's mm. clever. Mm. And then the grab the loot is the core mechanic of the game. Okay, I wonder if it's almost a, a series then. If there are other rattle battles with I different subtitles, don't think so. Okay, um, but the the subtitle helps mm-hmm. because it, it explains what the game is really mm-hmm. about. It's about pirates. This is a pirate ship game. Arr. Yeah. And, and what you're really doing is you're just deciding, I'm going to contribute three pirate ships to this fight, and then you try to grab as much loot as you can from the non-player ships. Hmm. And when between each... Um, well, th- there are adventures, usually about five adventures per game. Um, they're they're kind of like rounds, right? And then each each round has turns, and, and, and those turns are quests. So... It, it gets a little confusing, but basically what you can do is you can randomly generate um, different scenarios from the huge stack of cards of scenarios that are there. And so you're like, okay, I need a green scenario, then I need a red scenario, then I need a green scenario, and then we're going to go to town. And so you have to decide, am I going to spend my sales now, or am I going to wait until the next phase, which is the next quest, which is randomly generated, and we're not sure what's going to happen. You know, hmm. So you might end up... Uh, going out there for a nice merchant ship, and you take all this loot, and then suddenly the Navy catches up to you in the next scenario. Hmm. And you're going to have to defend and decide, am I going to dump the loot? Am I going to take it to town? Am I going to fight? Am I going to risk it? Because you have to repair your ships if they get sunk, Mm -hmm. and all these other things. And it's really quite robust and a lot of fun. So reminds me a little of, um, from the way you describe a little bit of Pirates, uh, Sid Meier's Yeah, Pirates. I was thinking that too. Actually, yeah. yeah. Um, it, you mean the video game? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, you, you are not wrong, except this game can be played in about an hour, hour and a half, and... Uh, oh, that's, that's different. Nice. Yeah, it's different like, every Pirates time. Because Pirates takes forever. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I highly recommend it. The board game, uh, with no board, <laughs> called Rattle Battle, Grab the Loot. Check it out. Topic of discussion. All right, media discussion time. So, uh, like we said at the beginning of the episode, this was sent to us by screen name Raggedy on our uh, on our website. Of course, if any of you out there want to uh, contribute your own questions, you can reach us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, uh, pretty much wherever it is you want to get in touch with us. We what, are. What is our What is our uh, Twitter handle? Uh, it is at backward compat. No, and, no underscores or anything like that. And on Facebook, you can find us by typing in backward compatible. That's correct. Uh, either backward compatible or backward compatible.com. Backward dash compatible.com. Um, and of course, if you go to our main website, then we have links to a bunch of our stuff on there as well. Yes, and our, our Twitter feed is there as well. So you can find us in all those places. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but of course, the uh, the question that we're addressing today is uh, what do we think was the cause of the sort of death of couch co-op games? Those games that you would sit down at a console and play together with friends on the same television. Um, and is there anything that we can do to kind of bring those back? Um, and so, I mean, my initial thought of this, or <clears throat> my initial thought on this is that it's convenience. You know, as soon as we started having internet co-op games or even internet competitive games, the need for you to have someone come over to your house to sit on your couch to play something with you was well eliminated. If I if I could be cynical here, which mm-hmm. I know is a departure. Whoa, whoa, what? Yeah, it's a departure from mine I normally am, but if yeah. I could be cynical for a moment here, you indulge me. Um I think this might have more to do with money. If if you have a local co op game, uh, it means that essentially one person buys a game mm. and then up to three addi- three additional people because normally these are four player a lot of these are four player games can come by and play sometimes more than four people mm-hmm. can all come and play based on that one purchase that's a good point but if you have an internet mm-hmm. game that is that is co-op I mean Every, online everyone co-op, has to own the game everyone has to own their own copy mm-hmm. and that right there I think is and sometimes the, you can't even buy a used copy you have to buy a new one in order yes, to get the online code right because you have to get the the code to yeah, unlock the online version so mm-hmm. really I think that that if more than anything else this mm-hmm. is really motivated by money. And that's why we, unfortunately, don't have any local co-op games, or very few local co-op games anymore. The ones that we have, um, many of them are on Nintendo systems, mm-hmm. and but I most agree, of those yeah. honestly are typically versus games. Like mm-hmm. um, Smash Brothers, sure, you can play team mode too, but you're still playing against someone, mm-hmm. um, even if it's the computer. So technically you can play that co-op, but it's really meant for like a versus experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mario Kart is a complete versus experience. Mm-hmm. You're against everyone else. There are, there's no alliances in Mario Kart. Absolutely. All, all their party games, um, like the Animal Crossing game that came out recently for Wii U, is a lot like Mario Party in a lot of ways. Yeah, and, and, Mar- and Mario Party is totally competitive. I mean, it's, yeah. I'm not saying that they're, you're not going to like kill people over mm-hmm. Mario Party. You're going to get in fist fights like you might over, like say, Street Fighter. Yeah, but. you might. You want, to take, you want to take this outside, Jim? I think there's a deep, deep irony to this, mm. and it's that our TVs are bigger than they've ever been. And um, we use them less. <laughs> yeah, I, well, the, the real estate on the TV is finally big enough to be able to play these co-op games mm. meaningfully while sitting on the couch mm. instead of three feet away yeah, from with the TV. Yeah, with the split screen. So yeah, exactly. There is a recent example of one that came out. Um, the uh, Diablo 3? Oh, yeah, that's true. That's actually a really good I was actually going to talk about that later. But, um, but Borderlands ahead. 2, um, or actually it's not just Borderlands 2, they released Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel as a PS4 re-release. I think yeah, they I was going to mention the Borderlands. Collection. Because Borderlands um, and is they a actually, game that, that is great when yeah. you co-op. And they actually pitched that as, like, we're bringing couch co-op back. Yeah. Like, even the trailers had, like, a bunch of cosplayers sitting on the couch and playing um, Borderlands. Mm-hmm. Oh, on, so can you, can you do that? Yeah. I don't my, even play Butterlands, to be theory, honest. So. You, always, I, you always could on the console. That's versions. great that that's, that that's available. And you mm-hmm. play you pl- can play as a team, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. You, you always play as a team. My, my cynical theory actually has more to do with um, the demographic. Mm. I, I think that without picking on, on a specific age group too much, uh, I think that the use of things like um, texting, Facebook, that kind of a thing, has kind of given a generation an, an impression that um, you don't really need to be face-to-face in order to have effective communication and relationships. I can see that, yeah. Now, I, I, I honestly think that the, there's an error in judgment there, uh, and I think that um, there's a generation which is now uh, dating later, marrying later, that kind of a thing, and I don't want to get into... To, to, you know, uh, and there are more reasons for that. Yeah, there are. There are. <laughs> there are and, but, but I think that all of this is contributing to one sort of... Uh, general tendency, which is that uh, the value of sitting next to a person on a couch is diminished, generally diminished. And we can look at lots of different would, factors. Would that. you say the value has diminished, or would you say the perceived value? The, the perceived value. Okay. The, that's what I meant. Because that's what I would. That's what yeah, I would. Absolutely, say. the yeah. perceived value. Um, and and I think it's interesting because I think that there's a lot of people who are coming to this new understanding that maybe their entire life they've sort of missed out on on a level of intimacy. That, um, and we're not even talking romantic. We're just talking. No, about I'm not. I'm just talking yeah. about having a, the idea of having. Hey, a let's friend. let's not limit anything here. Oh, well, okay. All right. um, but regardless, well, let's, not, let's not shut any doors. I, I, think, I think that there's this there's this. If we look at just design across the board, right? Mm. Um, the newer systems have uh, the ability to to hook up a headset with a microphone so that you can talk to the people that are on your team. Mm-hmm. Which is the worst thing that ever happened. Yeah, it, it, in many ways it is. <laughs> because it really ruins the games for me. In many ways it does. <laughs> uh, but you can kind of tune out the channel and have a private uh, channel, and, and some games will allow you to mm-hmm. do that, especially on PC. And what what I think 
really comes out of all of that is I've got everything I need right here. I don't need to be sitting next to a person. But there's some there's some nonverbals that come into play. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of having ten guys over uh, in your living room and mm -hmm. four of them get to play right now, mm -hmm. and then you go you know in shifts that kind of and a thing. There's, al there's also the factor of strangers versus people you know. I've always preferred yeah. playing, like, having, like, multiplayer, like, LAN parties or, like, couch co-op yeah, parties with people I know versus going online and playing with strangers. And, and I don't uh, want to talk to strangers. Uh -huh. I want to talk to people I know. And, I and that's, what I was, that's what I was actually going to mention, too, is is the LAN party, which is, um, I think, this, it, it also fits into this local co-op, even though you're not playing on the same screen, mm -hmm. you're in the same room. You're playing on your individual screen, but you're in the same room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you have that same experience. And, like, I have, I have a lot of great stories from... Playing, for example, um, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, uh -huh. which was a which is a, a game that never had local co op um, per se, but uh, you could play with people in the same room at LAN parties, right. and uh, what, that was some of the most fun that we had. I'd go on with some friends. I, I would get myself and three other friends, and we would sit around and we would play just for hours and hours and hours. Return to Castle Wolfenstein, mm -hmm. and uh, online versus people, we would just be on, we would just get on the same team, and we could coordinate much better, of course, because we're sitting on the same in the same room. But the fun part is that if if someone on your team messes up, uh, which admittedly sometimes that was me, uh, <laughs> but if someone messes up, um, you're not calling out a stranger. Then you kind of seem like a jerk. You're calling out your friend, so you just can look over at him and you can go, "Hey, what the hell was that? You're supposed to back me up over here." Right. You know, it, that's that's part of the fun, and that sort of adds to the camaraderie. Yeah. And even if you try to do that with strangers um, um, online, even if you don't mean it to be, you're not being a jerk. You're just getting into the game and having fun. Right. They may not take it that way. They might think that you're that you're actually being rude, yeah, and that's different. something that happens a lot. It's now. different when you reach over and you smack your friend for doing a thing when you bought the pizza. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's a completely different thing. Uh, whenever, um, whenever my college has uh, Harden Simmons has uh, homecoming every year, the, the CS people hmm. get uh, the computer lab. Installed with whatever the game of you know the the time the moment is. Sometimes it's nostalgic, sometimes it's not. And they will spend hours into the wee hours of the night reliving those grand old days of, of college in nineteen ninety nine through mm -hmm. two thousand three, four, five, whatever it was. And they you know we'll, we'll just play, we'll just play and play. I mean, I wasn't even a CS major, and I used to do this with them. Mm. Um, and Doom was Doom on the menu. Doom, oh, Doom was totally. <laughs> you got to have Doom. You got Doom, Doom Two, yeah. uh, Quake, all that stuff. But I mean, we we used to play some of the some of the strange indie stuff too. That was that was really and fun. RTSs were great for that too. Yeah, they were. They were fantastic. Eight. Some so, of the old Age of Empires games, for mm -hmm. example, a lot of some fun. of the betas. I mean, you yeah. name it. But but there was something about that community of, of guys who only got together once a year. But remembered how it was, and, and there was just that thing they wanted to reclaim. And the fascinating thing to me was none of the younger CS people did it. None of the current CS students did it. It was hmm. always us Gen Xers. You know, it was, it was the, the guys who kind of had that experience first, you know, and, and, and early. Um, and, and I don't know why that is. And I'm coming back again to that idea of a generational difference here and and I can't speak to it cuz I'm not a part of it but what what I want to really challenge or know from from our audience maybe is why why is that or is that is that a, is that a false perception I, I think no I think it's a I think it's a correct perception personally and I think a lot of that does have to do with this notion that um we can get that or the feeling that they can get that same experience um that same sort of connection through social media, yeah. which is not true, it's but not. they but they feel that they can, and therefore they feel well, I can still do that in an online game. Yeah. And coming back to my but it point, is different. Um, the convenience factor, like you know, that sort of party happens very rarely, and so it's like a thing that's like a big event, and you all look forward to, it and you have to plan around it. But why go through all that effort when you can just hop online with a bunch of friends? Well, not well, to but, be rude. Mm -hmm. Oh no, wait, I, I will be rude. <laughs> it's the effort Stealing my that job, makes it. Mm -hmm. Worth it, yeah. and yeah. that's that's what I'm saying. Though it's the convenience factor. It's is supposed that, to be inconvenient. Yeah, yeah, but you know, so like there's there's that there's that trade off, right? The more effort you put into something, the more rewarding it is. But, well, it's just but, lazy. But if you're, but, but like just like, in general, and like in everything, not even just talking about gaming, not even talking about social lives, like convenience is always going to win. Out. Let's and let's no, look at that. I'm not so sure about that. No, and I think, for example, like back in uh, say back in the day, I never owned uh, a Super Nintendo, but I, there was someone on the block that did. Right. And he was he was popular and what and big, you knew it yes, too. And I knew he had a Super Nintendo. Everybody knew he had a Super Nintendo. <laughs> and so we would go over. All I had was a, was a NES growing up. So I would go to his. People would go to his house because he got a Super Nintendo and he got Street Fighter Two. Yeah. Which Street Fighter Two was a big game that people had oh, for, yeah. for the SNES. 
and uh, just because of the, the way it was ported. So we would everyone would go over to his house, and this is only a two-player game. Only two people can play at once. Right. But he would have, you know, between... He'd have all the kids in the neighborhood there. So he'd have yeah. between eight to 12 kids there. Attorneys. Yes, it and they would have tournaments, attorney. and mm-hmm. people would people would come, and they would sit, and they would play, and that was a huge experience, mm-hmm. and, I, and and some of that was also born from to 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 also date myself a little bit with, from the arcade scene back in the '90s as well, mm-hmm. where you would go, and these these were strangers, these were people that you just meet at the arcade, yeah, but you have this 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 kind of this relationship, this bond with these people. Mm-hmm. It's it doesn't go beyond you sitting there playing a game. Right. But you you go, you meet some people. Uh, sometimes you play a co op game like say a beat 'em up game, like mm-hmm. say the X Men arcade game or Ninja Turtles. Mm-hmm. You get like three other people with you and you go through or in the case of the X Men you get five other people if you find the six person cabinet. Uh-huh. And you you play with these people, you get to know them, and you have this experience, the shared experience that by the time if you play all the way through, and a lot of times people will come and go, they run out of quarters, they'll they'll, they'll yeah. take off. <laughs> but there'll be people I mean, I, I said at one of these machines, I came on shortly after they had gotten a little bit into the game. I think we got past Whirlwind, one of the early bosses, mm-hmm. and um, I stayed all the way to the end. And there was uh, there were about three other people on that machine. That same deal, because because we were good enough that we didn't lo- lose that many quarters, but we still we still ended up putting about five bucks in the machine. Yeah. Still, but but you know we didn't lose too much that we felt we had to walk away. So by the time that was over, even though we didn't talk that much. We didn't really talk that much between us, aside from like, oh, hey, I'm going to do this or that kind of thing occasionally. Mm-hmm. But because we had this shared experience on screen and we saw each other through our avatars, by the time that was over, um, uh, it felt as though I knew these people. Like they were they were comrades in arms, right. so to speak, yeah, no by the end of it. And I think that's, a, that's an experience that um, I think is really missing yeah. from a lot mm-hmm. of the current generation. And part of that is because... Um, arcades really aren't a thing here in America no, anymore. No. They're a thing in Japan. They're still huge over there. Yeah. And and I don't know if they're if they're big in some parts of Europe. Maybe they still are. Uh, yeah, actually, in but, London um, you can find really, them. But I mean, and you can find if you if you go looking, you can find arcades here. Mm-hmm. But there's not many anymore. That's and, the, true. and the ones that, that exist, um, they they've sort of moved to that barcade experience. Yeah. But that's a little bit different. I mean, it's it's kind of fun to go. They're attached to other things, right? Mm-hmm. You can go, you can drink a little bit, and you can you can play a game. But that's not the same experience because. Well, it's it's people there. You know, you're you're drinking. You're there. You're there a little bit more to socialize. It's a little bit less of a focus on on the gaming. Yeah, as opposed to I'm finally old enough that I could actually. I'm finally old enough I could actually afford to go to the arcade. But there's no reason to (laughs) anymore because people don't people don't go anymore. When I was in high school, we had a nickel Mm. uh, arcade, Mm -hmm. and and it was brilliant because they intentionally set the price really really low so that you would spend all day there yeah and in the end you and ended up spending 10 20 30 bucks and then they sell they sell food there like concession stands and stuff too it was a snack bar but yeah. i mean it was it was in a place strategically located so that you could pop outside you could get some pizza you could come back you, you mm-hmm. have to get the pizza grease on your fingers yeah. on some of those on some of those machines yeah I'm, I, you're laughing but i i, I will swear by this and no, i can't I've, be the only one that I've, thinks that you play better Especially for like uh, games, like really old school arcade games, like Donkey Kong or Pac Man or something. You got the grease on your fingers. You can just roll no, it's, the, it's the, the joystick twitch, around. You've yeah. got you, when, when when those actual uh, joysticks were sticking up out of the thing, yeah. and you could flap. You know, just. Yeah. And like you and like on, on Pac Man, you don't want to have your hand on there. You get all the grease going, and then you just you slap it. That's when right. You get to the right part, you I, slide it around. It yeah. sounds it sounds weird to say that, but it's totally true. Well, I think, yeah, but if you get grease on my controller, I'm kicking you out of my house. <laughs> I think the, the right. other, but 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 in the arcade, that's like socially accepted. If you go to if you go there and there's you expect grease to be on the joystick. That's so right. Well, think about it this way. Um, I'm I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna buy a new PS4 hypothetically, right? What what comes in it? I mean, there's like there's like dozens you can choose from, right? But what comes in it? Uh, one controller, right? Sometimes a game, right? Um, although usually, if it's a game, it's a digital already on there. Yeah, the a lot of times. Um, and well, I think every time nowadays they're just using digital at this yeah, point. Yeah, you don't you don't need um, the disc. And then usually a headset, right? And then yeah. like the cords you need to hook up to your. TV. But just one controller, right? Is something to emphasize. One controller, yeah. mm-hmm. and that's where I was going with that. Um, remember, whenever the the NES came out, mm-hmm. what did it come mm-hmm. with? Two, two, two controllers and a gun and a thing and a whatever, right? Uh, Super Nintendo, two controllers. When did we stop? Packaging two controllers was it was it between PlayStation and PlayStation Two? No, I think PlayStation just had one. Uh, same thing with the, the N sixty four. I think they just had one at that was point. It? Even though with N sixty four, they even still had a pretty big focus on local co op mm-hmm. with that system. Yeah, they especially did. four player. Mm-hmm. They had a but, big focus on that. Except at the same time, they only the gave you one controller. The controllers mm-hmm. weren't that expensive. Nowadays, you go, you get that. Oh, it's, like, it's like sixty five bucks yeah. for a controller. You, a yeah. controller is more than a game at this point. It's mm-hmm. it's it's crazy. Yeah. I, I buy one so that I can have one charging. While I'm playing with the other one, because that's how long I game. <laughs> that's literally that's literally the reason. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I I've never played co-op on the, on 
Well, I wonder if three or four, honestly. Mm. PlayStation. I, I wonder if part of this though comes down to um, just the fact the games are more pervasive. More people own consoles, or at the very least, they have more people who play games on the PC. So, like you know, it used to be that like you know, you mentioned Jim going over to the kid who had the SNES. Yes, and you, everyone would go to his house, and I had similar experiences. Like you go to the friend's house who has the console that you don't have. Yeah, that's right. Those games, but now everyone has the same console and everyone has the same games effectively. And if you don't, then it's just because you don't care enough to get that console or that game. Well, also cross console play is a thing. Mm-hmm. So like whenever I'm on playing, let's say Battlefront, even though I haven't played in months now. Um, I don't really know who I'm playing against. I could be playing against some PC gamers, or I could be playing against some mm-hmm. some yeah. X boners. That, that's you know? happened a lot. Or, or <laughs> I don't know. Or even if it doesn't, they don't have cross play. You, they still will have because so many games are multi platform now yeah. that you don't necessarily you're not limiting yourself. If you get a PS4, you mm-hmm. can you can play pretty much all. There's a few exceptions, but you can play pretty much all the games that are on the Xbox yeah. One and the PC too. A lot of those games have are across all systems. Mm-hmm. But of course, you can't play Bayonetta two unless you have a Wii U. And how dare Nintendo! This is something yeah. we talked about. You know, it's funny. Show. I actually wrote a paper about that as one of my comps mm. uh, for my, for my doctoral uh, work. It mm. was it was what, what would happen if hypothetically someday all of these systems were to talk to each other and we could actually play cross platform? What mm. would it mean? Would there be an inequality mm. in gameplay? I actually wrote that, and, mm. and really, there is from what I from what I've been looking at and seeing the games that have cross play. What they'll try to do is they'll actually intention some of them will intentionally try to handicap the control of PC players yeah, I noticed that. because they have when you're on a PC you have way more uh, control precision and and in the precision yeah. and because of the mouse yeah. um, that that you are really a, a console gamer has no chance they really they they just don't have a yep. chance unless the the game intentionally tries to to screw over the PC player which is one of the reasons why. Uh, a lot of PC gamers get a little annoyed when they do this and mm-hmm. would prefer to just play with PC players because they'd rather have the precision but play with less people yeah. than have to deal with what feels like the game screwing you over just to give people on a console a chance. It's a design problem. It's, it's, it's an interesting challenge. And so I think that if we sort of start talking a little bit about the how do we revive the couch yeah. co-op, um, the design thing. Well, first of all, should we? Well, I well, think I, I think I think it, it offers a different enough experience, and I, and I, I wouldn't limit it to couch either. Mm-hmm. I think I think it would just say, let's say, local um, co-op. social co-op. Mm-hmm. So it's like okay. you're either you're either playing on a couch together on one screen, mm-hmm. you're playing in the same room on multiple screens, mm-hmm. like a LAN party, yeah. or you're playing um, on the same machines mm-hmm. in a place of business, like mm-hmm. an arcade. So those right. are the three different experiences that I think all fall into the same um, umbrella that I we're agree. talking about. And I think in a way, like if kind of the social gaming element is what you're looking for, there's still ways to get that outside of video games. Tabletop games are still a really excellent way to have a social gameplay experience. Yes, um, and and that's something that, that I, I do think is, is worth talking about because I think that is one of the big, uh, the reasons why there there's this, seems to be this resurgence and um, of tabletop games mm-hmm. Uh, they seem to be thriving right now. And I think a big reason for that is that uh, a lot of gamers from our generation have gotten older, and uh, they're noticing that there's this lack of local co-op in video games. Mm-hmm. And uh, traditional games, um, or tabletop games, they allow you to still have that experience of local gaming yeah. without actually having to wait for a video game that will actually give you that. Mm-hmm. Um but I think that if you design games in a way that kind of requires that you be in the same room for it to really work right. Um, you know, an example of a game that is a co-op game that came out recently, um, Triforce Heroes, Legend of Zelda, on the 3DS. Sure, you, yeah. You can play that locally, but you can also play it online. And they have ways of kind of facilitating, like, the lack of voice chat, for example. Like, you can do, like, little emotes. And a lot of times, the puzzles, I think, are intuitive enough that you can kind of figure out what it is that everyone needs to be doing. Also, mm-hmm. Link doesn't speak. Mm-hmm. So, that's... Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but like so that's 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 one of those and actually there are quite a few games on 3DS um and other handhelds I imagine that kind of have an element of that where um for example uh, Monster Hunter is a really popular co-op game mm-hmm. that you each play on your own little controller or your each uh, your own little system um but an example that comes to mind uh, is Artemis um, the the spaceship bridge simulator game, kind of mm, like yeah, Star Trek, but yeah. not officially Star Trek, where you each have a different person with a different role, and they each have their own machine. And um, you know, when I've seen people do setups before, where they actually kind of like recreate the bridge of you know Star Trek ship or something like that, and they'll have a, one big screen up on the projector that the captain's looking at, and then everyone else has their own monitors that they're looking at. Um, and that's something you could technically play online, but it kind of like doesn't feel as fun unless you're actually in the same room and you're yelling at each other and you're on the same bridge. Mm-hmm. You know? do, do you think that's something that maybe that's one way to to revive the experience is to focus more on 
um, handheld systems and mobile systems. Um, I'm not a huge fan of mobile gaming, but mm. I mean, if you focus on those two, because it's the, the thing the that everyone, there, everyone has and everyone, everyone can with have them. it. And, yeah. and the same thing with the handheld systems. If you, you could bring it with you anywhere, mm. yeah. you don't have to worry about, Hey, does this person have a large enough TV or, mm. just, or in the case of a land party, they have enough screens mm. or which of us is going to be the one that has to buy the console and the game and have right. everyone over and that sort of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of that, it's the like, rich kid. That's always the answer. Yeah. <laughs> if everyone has a, say a 3ds or everyone has say a smartphone, if they're doing using those and they all play the same game mm -hmm. um, you can just go over you can sit anywhere and you can play together mm -hmm. so maybe that's one way around it what mm -hmm. do you think about that I think you're right and I think that it's it's a matter of sort of just adjusting to the new climate of the industry you know the fact that everyone does either have a console or a PC if they care to game like that but the way that you're going to get more people to interact, I think, is with the tabletop that forces you to come together or with handhelds like, say, mobile devices mm -hmm. that everyone has and everyone always has with them. And mm -hmm. this is this is something that I would like to stick a pen in and possibly talk about later. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think uh, the arcade experience, which is related to this in terms of social gaming, mm -hmm. um, an in-person social gaming, I should say, mm -hmm. How does that scene? How does that? How could that scene itself be revived? And that might be something to focus on for an entire sh to an entire show well, as a topic. Yeah. But that's something that I, I also think that that experience is an interesting one because you're unlike with these experiences where you're going you're you're sitting down with someone and playing on a handheld system or a phone with people mm -hmm. that you know, or mm -hmm. you're going to someone's house, or you're going to like a land party. This is you're going to a place where you can play video games mm -hmm. with complete strangers, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of a little bit similar to um, uh, LAN. Uh, what it's called, like like land places, like Shadowland that we have here in Dallas, yeah. mm -hmm. where you can go and you can play um, uh, heavy social games mm -hmm. and social experiences with people that you don't know. But the arcade, that was sort of what it was all about. Mm -hmm. Well, think about like laser tag or whirly ball, mm -hmm. that kind of a yes. thing, right? Precisely, there is yes. no way for that to occur outside of the outside places. of the context of that place. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so. And they have those places, and they, they sort of turn those into um, event centers yeah. mm -hmm. where yeah. they have arcade games as well. As so well. you go there to play something like and Laser pizza. Tag yeah. and, ha and eat bad pizza. And it's also Maybe more physical games, yeah, like yeah. bowling. Mm -hmm. But then they also have arcade games you can play there. Uh, although I do find it interesting where I went to one of those places at Dave & Buster's with some people from work. Mm -hmm. And aside from the people that I went there uh, from work... Um, Strangers didn't really seem that into playing the multi multiplayer games. No. I noticed that, no, and I would come up and I, and I, you know, I'd, I'd come up and I'd, I'd want to play, and then people just seemed a little off put by Weirded it. out by the, um, know, this guy who wants to play. Yeah. Whereas, whereas back in the day, this was this was a common experience. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, yeah. very common. If you're in an arcade in the '90s, you can expect if you're on, if you're in a game that is more than one player, mm -hmm. you will expect someone to walk up to you and and Pop put a quarter, put a quarter in, down and, and help you out. Yeah. Either and help you out if it's a co-op. I think that's part or of it. Or challenge is, you. Say, hey, yeah. I got next, or I'm yeah. gonna let's let's play after this. Yeah, and I think you part of it is just that. that we we've gotten used to the solo gaming experience. If Isolation. It, and if not solo, online, <laughs> where you're basically by yourself, you just happen to be playing with other people. Do you think it's people are um, a little bit more trepidatious about strangers now? Do you think that's a little bit of it? I think that might be. I mean, especially if... Like, I know I'm, a, I'm an intimidating person. People see me and they go, whoa, look out. <laughs> there are, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Because but. like they're kind of like, I think, two big things that can happen if you play online. One, you get turned off by and you never want to. Or two, you realize you would never want to interact with these people in real life. <laughs> you know, and like even if they're actually like really cool people in real life, like just in general, like the online experience to me seems unpleasant enough that I wouldn't come out of playing online with the impression I'd love to play with people but, in real life. But I think people in real life also will react differently. Well, of course, you're not going to act. You're not going to be a super jerk mm -hmm. if you're playing someone say in like Mortal Kombat yeah, no, and an arcade. I, I completely agree. I mean, they, you might still trash talk, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be the same sort of trash talk. Yeah, the yeah. trash talk you get online is this. Some, I mean, sometimes I don't do this, but there's mm -hmm. people that can get very, very juvenile, mm -hmm. very rude. Um, that just don't take well to losing at all. Yeah, that's true. And, and really will just resort to name-calling immediately, or if they win, they'll act... It goes beyond trash talk. Mm -hmm. They just decide to be total assholes about it. Mm -hmm. And it's not the sort of experience that you get in an arcade. Yeah. There's there's trash talk, and then there's just being an asshole. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're standing next to a guy who can punch you in the face, yeah, it's, it's a little mm -hmm. different. But mm -hmm. but also, I, I, I think that's part of it, but I really do think that, that when you... I don't I don't think it's just about worried about getting punched in the face. Oh, I, do I didn't think mean there's, it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I do think there's this... You see them as a person when they're standing yeah, there. Yeah, as opposed to... Whereas if they're online and you don't see them, it's almost like they don't exist. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, going back to the arcade 
um, idea, like what is it that would might draw people more to the arcade? And I think it is the thing that you can only get it there. Well, um, and I remember one of the things that used to be a big draw of the arcade to me, and one of the reasons I get excited to go is like you have all the the peripherals, like the shooters with the actual yeah. like, guns, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. yeah, the driving games where you have steering wheels and gear shifts yes. and stuff like that. And not that you can't get that at home, but it's a lot of extra accessories for like you know one game, and that's if you mm-hmm. care enough about to get it. Mm-hmm. The games um, with the giant, the, the big giant uh, mm-hmm. trackballs. Mm-hmm. You typically are not going to have a controller yeah. that has one yeah. of those. And I wonder if like VR might be the next big thing that kind of gets people to come to an arcade to try it. Oh, that's a great without. Point having to buy the VR stuff to get it at home. That's an, uh, the reason why I sort of, I sort of gasped a little bit there and bristled up was mm-hmm. because um, the interesting thing about the VR experience would be that you're, you're standing there with other people, mm-hmm. so it feels like it's social, and yet you have this headset mm-hmm. on that is blocking out the world, yeah, the making you see something. So is, it, is, is that really or, social gaming? Or, or maybe, is that just... maybe it's not even VR so much as um, augmented reality. Like yeah, you're, you're, you're in a space. Mm-hmm. And you're, like, you're surrounded by screens. Everybody example. walks into the green room. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, you know, whenever I think about what's in the arcades, or if you prefer the barcades, you mm-hmm. know, whether it's a Dave & Buster's like you mentioned, or a main event, or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever it happens to be, bowling alley. Think about the... The stuff you can put your money or your card, because it's all card-based now, into. Mm. How many of those are actually video games? And how many of them are ticket mills? Yeah. You know I, what I'm I saying? I always avoided the That's true, mills, yeah. But. Because 90% of what's there, maybe that's too high. I don't know. It depends but on the 60, place that you go. 60, honestly, it really depends on the place you go. Yeah. <laughs> but I walk in there and I'm like, oh, cool, they have a Terminator game. Or, oh, cool, they have a Jurassic game. Mm. Or, or, oh, neat, they have a racing game. That mm. sort of a thing. And it feels like it's one little section or, or they're just kind of peppered around on all the roll the wheel of fortune mm. and win the tickets and yeah. buy a teddy bear because you just spent... 30 bucks on, on a $5 teddy bear, you stupid <laughs> idiot. You know, it's like, that's what it's really about. But you had fun along the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you um, really? No. <laughs> you know, and, and you're saving up for the 16,000 tokens it takes to get the, the you know, the, the console you can take home and then ignore people with. You know, the irony there <laughs> the collectible is Collectible Voltron ring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's just not, there are not that many that I've seen um, actual video games of the style we're talking about, which would promote the co-op play. My favorite are the ones where you get into the, the game, you sit in the chair next to your buddy, you yes. both have guns, mm-hmm. and you're going through the, the very guided mm-hmm. on-a-rails uh, on experience. Rails, yeah, like shooter. Mm-hmm. This is shooter. Yeah, I love those things. Those, those, are, are, those are really cool. Or, or great. I, uh, same thing with all like the the standing games like um and oh, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name I want the time crisis yeah, yeah. Time with crisis the pedal was great. yeah where you step on the pedal to like duck to behind time something crisis, dude. like that like your yes. experience you were talking about like trying to get through the arcade machine mm-hmm. there was one time when I spent like three or four hours with people just trying to blaze our way through yeah. time crisis eventually we got to the final boss and we just couldn't beat it and if you're we playing that quarters and if you're yeah. playing that game with with a person that that is a stranger when you first start playing. Mm-hmm. You're gonna get you're gonna get pretty close because yeah. you're again comrades in arms. You're playing, yeah. you're having you're, you're experience. You're Arnold trying Schwarzenegger to win. style, like you know the, the handshake with like the biceps yeah. and everything, like you're very, <laughs> the commando. Yeah. Like you're, you're shaking the arms and flexing your yeah. biceps. <laughs> exactly. I wish you could see these guys right now. <laughs> wow, that yeah. was that was good. We do not have biceps, by the way. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we do. We wouldn't be able to move our arms. Are they, are they monoceps? <laughs> yeah, there you go. But, no, I, I our arms don't move. We just kind of like. <laughs> I think it's an intricate puzzle that that has a number of of problems. And the first is those types of games aren't being made right now. They're not being made because they're not popular. They're not popular because society and and, and generational ideas have changed. Those have changed because the hardware has changed. Mm-hmm. The hardware has changed. Because and, it's a and big cycle. And there's not a good environment for it. Like like we're right. saying with the arcades, there's there's arcades are just not popular enough. If these game, it's not that the games themselves people couldn't wouldn't want to play. It's that in order to you. No one can just, I mean, people can, but to actually buy an arcade cabinet for yourself is extremely expensive. Uh-huh. It's cost prohibitive. So you have to go to a place where you can play them. That's right. And if a place is going to house those, they can't just house one game. They have to house multiple games. Because, exactly. And by then, it's a huge cost. Mm-hmm. So these places, in order to survive, have had to find a different business strategy, mm-hmm. like a Dave & Buster's, mm-hmm. or that, that has, like you said, mostly ticket games or mm-hmm. things like bowling, mm-hmm. or, or like laser tag. In addition to a few arcade games, yes. Or a place like a barcade where really um, the idea is we're just going to use the arcade arcade games to keep you there drinking. Really, you want to sell you alcohol because alcohol is expensive. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't care about how much money they're presenting into quarters. So that's why we have so few arcades out there. It's that that it's it's just not a popular experience anymore. It kind of makes me sad because I feel like gaming itself, the gaming culture, has, has lost something there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I and think, sa- same with the couch yeah. co-op, and same with same with the land parties. We've lost that experience mm-hmm. that we used to have, and that's why those games that are so far and few between, like a game that I didn't even really like, Diablo three. Mm-hmm. Very disappointed Diablo three when it came out on PC. Very disappointed. Yeah, but everybody when it, was. <laughs> everyone was. Yes, but when it came out on um, the console. Uh, a couple of my friends who felt the same way about it, disappointed, we all were like, hey, let's pull our money, let's buy Diablo 3 on console. Why? It's one of the few, it was an actual, it was a co-op game, mm-hmm. we could all play together, yeah. and it, it, there's so few of them, we just, we had to buy it, just to play through, and we, we played, we played through the game, it's not like it, we had, it was like the best experience, but it was more fun, even though they can kind of, you know, dumb down some of the controls a little bit, mm-hmm. and some of the way that it played. I'd say that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but it was a lot, it was a lot more fun, we had a lot more fun with it, because we were together, mm-hmm. and we could screw around with each other, and we could like, you know, have little games where we would tell each other, okay, uh, for this next segment, you can't drink any potions. <laughs> Things like that, 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 that are just add a little bit of extra fun because you're playing with, you're playing with friends or you're mm-hmm. playing with other people, and it makes the experience different. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's about time to wrap it up, so mm-hmm. what, what final thoughts can we throw out there about this interesting topic? Well, if we could revive uh, local co-op games to the point where we could make money off of them, um, I'm sure that there'd be plenty of companies interested in that, but I don't think that um, any of us three can necessarily solve that problem to where it is a profitable, Absolutely. or I should say a, that's the wrong term even, a more profitable experience. That's the thing. If they can make more money using a different strategy, they're going to do it. Even if they can even if they can make profit from these local co-op games, can they make more? Or the yeah. arcade experience, can they make more by doing this? And part of that really. would have to be having to be exclusive to that to force people to come and do it, but mm. then why would you do that when you can just as easily distribute to mobile or to Steam? or whatever yeah. else. Or, 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 and force is, force is a bad word. It's a, you encourage them to mm-hmm. do it. And, and is it really, is it enough, like mm-hmm. you say, to just give them that one experience? Yeah. Well, not, not really. Why, why should they? Why should they limit themselves? We need a mall revolution, and we need to pull... <laughs> a dance dance revolution. Yeah, uh, we need to pull <laughs> this idea, and a new, a new idea, if you will, of a, of the, you know, the mall hallway that's in the middle of the mall. Mm-hmm. Have something in the, in the middle of that hallway that's dark. So that you can't not walk past it, right? And that's where the arcade is. It's not. It's not in a store, but it's like literally out in the middle of everything. And then that would be interesting. Yeah. And then what you've got is like pods, uh, lots of pod games. You know, Mech, the Mech Warrior pod mm-hmm. game from like the, the early '90s. Mm-hmm. That kind of it was terrible graphics, but it was a lot of fun. Update that stuff. Mm-hmm. Look at Japan. Look at you know. And, and they have they have updated yeah. these. It's just that they import, don't have them here. Import yeah. all that stuff over. I think it would do brilliantly well i really do i that's actually a pretty good idea and i think that that if malls could do that yeah and i do um, like the idea of putting it out in the middle of like out in the open rather yeah. than saying hey go into the nerdy place where yeah. everyone's playing right. it's, it's not in the dark back it, corner it's yeah. the pavilion it's, it's in it's in the open yeah. it's in this open space and people can walk by and people, see yes. people having fun on it and say mm-hmm. like hey i want to try that it looks awesome you know yeah. the thing you'd have to worry about is the light because obviously it's mm. you know it, it needs to somehow be in indarkable mm-hmm. <laughs> but mm. other than that i I don't know. Throw throw some engineers at it, and, mm-hmm. and I think that it could work. Rethink the yeah, whole have like experience. little like um, the old like Jurassic Park games. You yeah. know, you sort of go into that little thing. And there's a curtain around you. Yeah, yeah. Each but then also point. have a screen on the outside so people can see the gameplay. Maybe even have a camera. Oh yeah, just a window. That that would be oh, yeah. great. Window, actually, like have like a couple of monitors where you see, like have, there's a camera on the inside so you see the people inside having fun. Yeah. But there's also a screen showing I, what's happening on, in the game. I like showing what's happening in the game. I would mm-hmm. hesitate to put screens showing people having fun because mm-hmm. the problem with that is. There's plenty of people that are self-conscious, especially true. the ones that might yeah. be most interested in playing these true, games. True, true. So that might prove prohi- uh, um, a little prohibitive. They mm-hmm. might not want to see... Like, I don't want people to see my expression when I'm playing this game. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I would... But I do like the idea of having mm-hmm. large screens out that they can show for mm-hmm. each game. Yeah. Oh, look at the experience this person is having with this game. Right. But here's, here's some of the gameplay. Mm-hmm. Don't you want to try it out? Yeah. Uh, that, that's possibly an idea. I like that idea quite a bit. There you go. Hopefully someone is listening to this can steal this idea and make it. <laughs> Or give us lots of money so we can... Yeah, there you go. We'll, go, we'll, we'll go into business. We'll get started down at Stonebriar and yeah. we'll uh, <laughs> see if we can make that happen. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us for an episode number 59 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. And thank you to uh, Radge, or Ragdi, sorry, again for uh, giving us your question. Uh, so until next time, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. Thanks for listening. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. 
Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.